Hi guys, good evening. Can you just uh, raise your hands or say hi in the uh, comment section so I know you can hear me okay? Is that is that okay? Okay, that's that's brilliant. Oh, thank you very much for taking your time out of your uh, busy schedules to uh, well to listen to me. I I really do appreciate it. So thank you. I just wondered how many of us at this moment in time have a conversation going on in our heads with regards to the current cost of living crisis. I dare say there's probably many of us are deeply, deeply concerned, not just with the rise of price, uh, prices, but the speed by which they've risen. I know, for instance, when I listen to people talk about the cost of living crisis, they will talk either about petrol prices or they'll talk about diesel prices and the affordability and then there's the grocery shopping where they buy the food and each week they return to the whatever store they go to and they're finding out that in that particular store the groceries have gone up yet again it seems to be happening more and more all the time and then with energy prices and i think particularly with energy prices at this moment in time They've gone up around 100%. And we did think initially that there would be some type of cap, but we now know that the cap, once again, is going to be removed next April. That's in the UK. I can't speak for other countries, but certainly the inflation <clears throat> has gone really high. And I think what makes people very, very fearful is, <clears throat> is not knowing what's going to happen and the speed by which the prices have gone up. And I think that's making people very, very scared, very, very nervous with regards to the decisions that they could make. Which brings me a very relevant point. We are all gonna have some very big decisions that we're going to need to make. Some people will find that the, the very way that they live their lives is going to change dramatically. Some people will find that the businesses that they were operating are no longer as profitable as they were before. And as a consequence of that, you're going to have to make some really big decisions. And the quality of the decisions that you make today have a direct relationship with the quality of life that you're going to lead in the future. And that's very important. And that means that you need to be able to make decisions that you feel as if you're taking control and you can move forward with a degree of confidence. For me, and in the last 30 years, I realized now more than ever that I had a formula that I was using. And I think the appreciation for this formula that I was using only came about perhaps in the last five to 10 years. But I now know that I was using this formula formula even without being consciously aware of it and when i looked at the decision making that i've taken in the past and i think about <clears throat> the outcomes from that decision making then <clears throat> i think it's been very successful for me and i want to tell you a little bit about that process what i went through and and the way that i the way that i became more aware of the process that i was undertaking but before i do that i just want to talk a little bit more about making decisions and making decisions, particularly from fear. It's so easy in these times when things are very difficult for us. to look at the situation that we're surrounded by. And then want to sort of contain it in such a way that what we want, that what we actually do is actually limit the field of possibilities or options that we have, because we're in this sort of, uh, we're so entrenched in our feelings and our emotions that we're not willing to step out of our comfort zone. The issue here is, of course, that when we make uh, decisions out of fear, then we are reducing the number of options that we have. And I dare say there's many people that are going to feel this way now, especially as they come into their decision making processes. A bit like a sort of rabbit caught into the headlights of a, a car approaching. Do you know the car's coming? Do you know the car's accelerating, coming faster? But they can't move. They find it very difficult. I've seen that type of reaction 
time and time again. It's that two million year old brain, the safety brain where we resort to fight, flight or freeze. And often it's the case when we're under tremendous pressure, what we do is we freeze. So <clears throat> making a decision, obviously, therefore, is far better to make, make, a, make a decision from a degree of confidence. And the question is, how do we build that confidence up in our decision making so we take more control of our, over our lives? One of the things that uh, we need to be certain of is that a decision is all about taking action. And all action is fathered or mothered by a decision that you at some time are going to take within your life. Decisions are the ultimate expression of your freedom. They are your God given right to be able to decide which way you're going to approach a particular problem. What I want to really sort of emphasize at this stage, before I start telling my story about my decision making, is that if we're making a decision from fear, that you're going to essentially just reduce the options that you have. And they say in business, like in the universe, only two things ever happen. It either expands or it contracts. And that's exactly what happens. And in our decision making, that's what will happen. So what I'd like to do is um, <clears throat> explain to you how my de decision-making process changed my life for the better. And also remember and recall that any idiot can make an easy decision, but for a tough decision to be made, we need strong, we strong, strong leadership. And that we have to have a process by which we can build up our decision making muscle and that's essentially what this webinar is about it's helping you to build up that decision making muscle in you and then adopt the process so you can move forward with your decision making so the pathway to successful decisions are through the threshold of control and we take control through the process that i'm about to tell you about and through part of the outcomes of this process is the energy that you will create positive energy because no doubt no doubt we all know that um if you're making a decision from fear you're not you're not going to um you're not going to have positive energy what you're going to have is energy that actually saps you it's going to sap your energy and take control of you so what I'd like to do is tell you about how I first discovered flow and part of my discovering flow, how I also discovered this process. Many of you here will be aware of the fact that um, will be aware of the fact that I have a martial arts background, whether that was uh, mainly within the sort of kickboxing and Thai boxing, which I was very competitive between the late seventies and the nineteen eighties. What you may not be so familiar with is that I was also a, a black belt, I still am a black belt third down within Jiu Jitsu. And I'm recalling something that happened when I was um, when I was 14 years of age. And just to put that in perspective for you, 14 for years of age for me is 45, nearly 46 years ago. And yet I have this ability to remember something, recall something quite vividly what happened to me all those years ago. Such was the power in it uh, and the learning outcome for me and something that I hold on to now with regards to my decision-making process. And in this particular class, we used to have a thing called the line out. And what would happen in the line out is that normally the man in the middle would be the person executing the technique. But in this particular situation, the guy in the middle was the person going to be thrown and people would come out consecutively and throw the guy in the middle. And I was a green belt, 14 years of age, training with the yellow and the orange belts in one corner. And in the other corner was my brother, who's, who's three years older than me. So he'd be 17, going on 18. 
and he was with the purple, brown, and black belts. And they were doing the brown belt syllabus. And uh, they were going very, very fast, what to me looked a very complicated move. And I remember training in my group and the chief instructor, who was a sensei John Hall, called me over and said, John, I would like you to join our group. Now, when I listened to him, I looked at me, I'm 14, I'm at senior school, and all of a sudden I've seen these young men aged between sources, 17 to 23, and then there were the black belts, eight late 20s, and some, some of them were in their early 30s. And I thought, well, I am going to be absolutely battered in this situation. And uh, not only that, they're actually doing a brown belt syllabus. How am I going to be able to cope with what they're actually doing? So I was obviously very concerned and um, I just didn't think that I had the ability to be able to do it. So Sensei John Hall, the chief instructor, who was a big guy, a big, big policeman, a senior policeman on Merseyside, but uh, very, very uh, nimble on his feet. And he showed me the technique, got me to join in within these guys. And we started to pick up speed and momentum and he only showed me the once but the most important thing for him and for my learning outcome was the rhythm of the movement of everyone and as as this as this system or as this technique was being executed as it was being executed i realized that i was improving every time i performed the technique and i was improving because a, I had no time to really think, consciously think about what was going on. And we were just expected to keep up with the momentum of everybody that was in the line out. But secondly, as I was working with people that were more advanced, I was able then to look at their technique. And as I was doing my technique, I was able to improve as it was going on. Now, I tell you this because this is my first experience of flow. And afterwards, we would go to the pubs then I was in 14, in the pub, drinking orange juice with all these guys. And later on, Cincy John Hall said to me, John, he said, what did you think of the session tonight? And I recall saying to him, well, to be honest with you, I really enjoyed it in the end. But I was really nervous about coming over when you asked me to join that group. After all, I'm a green belt and you were asking me to do a brown belt syllabus. So I said, I just didn't think. I would be able to do it. And he looked at me and he said, well, John, I don't really understand that. He said, the reason being is that for the last few years, you've learned how to throw someone. Over the last few years, you've learned how to do a row. Over the last few years, you've learned how to break somebody's balance. He said, and all we did was take them, took all these parts, put them together within this flow, uh, within, within this particular move. So what he was saying to me is that he took learning chunks that I already had, assembled them in a different order. And then once I joined the group, kept the group moving in such a way that my body just had to respond. So I wasn't consciously thinking, but in the end, the more confident I became, I was subconsciously responding. Some people like to call it muscle memory. I like to think it's, it's much more than that. It's powerful because I can remember it. And evidently, it's an emotional experience because it's been stored in my long-term memory. So the, my, that was my first instance of actually finding flow. And the learning income, learning outcomes from that perspective was, was simply because of the learning chunks that I had that I'd already been practicing for a number of years and they were put together in a slightly different way. And I, as a consequence to that, grew as an individual. As the faster it went on, my confidence grew in my ability because of what I was doing. And due to the rhythmic pattern uh, training, it just became ingrained. It became integrated within my body. The knowledge became ingrained in me as an individual. So that was my first experience of flow and also the realization that when I look at that period now is that obviously I had to overcome my limiting beliefs and the more I practiced, the more confident I became. 
And once you were in a rhythm of what you were doing within the pattern itself, that created a fantastic learning experience because I was feeling more confident as a consequence to the way the lesson or the, the class was organized. So that was my first experience, as I said, of flow. I'd like to talk about two other experiences. And so I'm going to talk about two, two fights, two kick, well, a kickboxing fight and a Thai boxing fight. Excuse me. And the only reason why I mention these again, because I want to talk about the different aspects of flow before I talk about flow and decision making in business. Because it will all come together with regards to the learning, the formulation of patterns and the way that it becomes ingrained within you as, as an individual. So the first fight I'd like, I'd like to talk about is a fight I had on the 3rd of April, 1983 in London. And that was, that was my British title fight. And I'm not talking to, to you today because it was my British title fight. That's not the point. What I want to do is talk about something that I did a few months prior to the fight and on the actual night of the fight. And that was a few months earlier, I'd seen this guy defend this title. And I just had this belief that I could overcome it, that I could beat him. Now, back in the 1980s, you challenged, but as it's, as it said now, you call somebody out. And I, I suppose that's exactly what I did. I called somebody out. Now, it was not like me. Um, although uh, some people say, oh, you, you always come across as very confident. It wasn't particularly like me. I could be confident in something that I know well. But like most of us, if it's something that uh, I've not practiced, I'm, uh, I'm not so confident in it. So I called this guy out. And I often look back at that and I wonder, so how did I ever get there? Well, most sports people will talk about hitting a plateau. And as you hit a plateau in your learning, it can be hard to break through. But if you're resilient and you're persistent in your endeavors and the way that you go about it, eventually you will break through. And that's exactly what I had been doing for the last month. I'd broken through this plateau that I had hit and I was moving forward rapidly and fast. And all of a sudden, like Sensei John Hall had done in my Jiu Jitsu, I was taking techniques and I was breaking them down, turning them around the other way, asking questions about the way they were put together. Because the reality in sport, what may be, may be right to me or the way that it's taught, may not be right for somebody else because of body shape and size. So I started breaking it around, kicking from different angles, punching from different angles. I started testing everything. And I felt my personal growth develop and an accelerated rate. So as I look back at that now, at that particular time, I'm able to say with a degree of confidence that what it was is, is something that I'd learned when I was 14 years of age. Now, if we want to improve on something, we have to be prepared to practice. If we want to master it, we have to practice, practice and practice. And with, with mastering something, there's this power in the mastery of patterns that you learn. And it becomes, the knowledge becomes integrated into you as a person. But the decision making is done really fast. Because when you're moving around and then you have to see whether your techniques are working, you're, you're dealing with somebody else. And that means you're having to make decisions in a split of a second. And also, take ownership of those decisions. Sometimes they may, may not be right and you will adapt it the next time. But all the time you're doing this, you're doing it on your feet. You're doing it on the move. And that's the important thing with regards to finding flow. It's being able to respond on the move without having to consciously think. And as you're doing that, you are building your decision-making muscle purely on the basis of the patterns and forms that you've learned that have really helped you progress because during it, the learning of it, the development and the improvement have made you make decisions on the way. Now I've told you about two successful things and 
I, I'm very aware that in telling you that, you may get the feeling that um, flow is about success. And that is definitely not the case. So I, I want to talk about another, uh, last phase I want to talk about is a fight at 1985, which was a fight I lost against a guy called Oliver Harrison. And so that was 5 threes tie boxing in Liverpool. Oliver Harrison is uh, quite a well-known guy uh, in the sense because he was all, also Amir Khan's boxing trainer. So you can look up Oliver Harrison. Now, the guy sadly passed away, I think a couple of years ago, but he was a tremendous tie boxer. And as the British kickboxing champion, uh, I was fighting him then for the British Thai boxing champion in Liverpool on my home soil. Uh, Oliver was from Bolton. And Bo o Oliver was a slow kind of fighter. And I was the type of fighter that used to press and close down very fast. Oliver immediately caught me with a right roundhouse kick to the head and took me down for a, a, a count of eight. I got up in rounds two, three, and four. I continued to press and take Oliver to fight to Oliver, taking Oliver down several times with leg kicks. But leg kicks, you don't get a count to them. It's just somebody being knocked down, a bit humiliating, but then they jump up. And then in the fifth round, it must have been about 30 seconds left. And this is the thing that really still today still cheeses me off. But I suppose if I was going to lose to anyone, the only technical knockout I ever suffered, because I've never been knocked out, but the only technical knockout I ever suffered was Oliver Harrison, because he caught me with exactly the same technique in the fifth round. And uh, my eye had completely closed. And the referee wouldn't allow me to fight on. And I recall in that moment, I asked my brother that was in my corner, I said, can you just slip my eye? We'll take the blood out of my eye and I'll, and I'll continue. And uh, mother's being mother's, she's jumped up and said, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. So that, that was the end of the fight. It, it came to an end. But the reason why I'm telling you this about this fight, which, which is, I, I think is quite important, is this, that flow is not about winning. It's certainly not about that, because I remember after that fight, though Oliver had won, he threw his arms around me and he said, never again. And he repeated it three times, never again, never again, never again. And I look back at that now and I think to myself, I think I know what he was going on about. What he was trying to express to me was this, that we both had trained and practiced exceptionally hard. We both brought our talents to the ring to the challenge and that on that day it was Oliver's fight to take that particular fight I think at those moments prior to me going down I was in flow however what I want to talk about this is that when I've made decisions that are not in flow and I've not used this process which has been about constant improvement belief responding to patterns what I was doing when I asked my brother to cut my eye, that was possibly ego. That was ego because I didn't want to go down. I was in front of my home ground. It was the wrong decision. And the referee was absolutely right. So I wanted to uh, tell you uh, about those fights because of the learning processes and the decision making to do with flow. And just to recap, because this is a big part of building what flow is about. It's, by having, it's about having learning blocks and learning outcomes that you've put together through practice and so many times that you then feel so good about it. You can then turn them upside down, turn them around, put them together in different ways and see if there's more learning from the process that you've been through. That you should see constant improvement in what you do consistently all the time. See constant improvement in what you do. And of course, the more you practice, the more it becomes integrated into your body. And the more you're making decisions on the move, you're not having to stop to consciously think about it. Excuse me. And it's just before I start talking about business and decision making, which is what I'm going to come on to next. 
for some of you saying, oh, these decisions you're making so fast. I, I, I can't do that. So I, I want to, re I, I'm going to make the assumption that everyone here can, everyone here can, um, can ride a bike. And when you were learning to ride your bike, you had to have the confidence to pick your feet up off the floor and to travel forward. And that took quite a bit of doing. And then you had to learn to turn the wheels on the bike and not fall at the same time. And before long, you were making all kinds of assessments and decisions. You were driving along, pedestrians were crossing the road, cars were coming at you, you had to overtake cars. What you didn't do is that you didn't have to stop to consciously think about it. You were aware of what was going on, but you were so practiced on what you were doing that you were able to make these maneuvers and these decisions very fast. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. It is that capability that we all have where the knowledge can become integrated into the body through constant patterns and constant uh, practice. Well, I want to tell you about something else. Uh, and, and this is a, a, about a decision not getting made in flow because my last fight was in Miami in 1988. <clears throat> and it was a great fight. So I'm not going to talk. It was great from my perspective anyway, because I, I knocked this guy out in, in, in the first round. But towards the end, I realized I was losing my love and my joy in what I was doing. And um, <clears throat> I realized I'd lost my passion for it. And it, it's quite a hard thing to step into the ring, not feeling passionate about something, but at that level, also putting yourself into uh, basically in a lot of danger. So I had this big decision to make. What was I going to do with the rest of my life? Here I am approaching 25. I think it was a couple of months of 25. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I had to make this really big decision. During this last fight, uh, I, I had met somebody, uh, Dr. Benjamin Savenia, who was starting the All-American Stars, stars uh, sporting with the astronauts in, in, in NASA, it was going to be massive. It was absolutely going to, and it sounded so exciting. And he wanted me to be part of that team that was going to train, um, train professionals, but also train, uh, help the astronauts get fitter. And it, it was fantastic. And uh, we, he was going to get me an employment to work within a, a work permit to work in the United States. He was, um, he had all kinds and he offered me this marvelous contract. And I remember thinking, you know, it was probably too good to think, uh, <laughs> think true, too good to be true when I, when I look back at it now, but it all sorts of came together. But I'm a great believer in serendipity and that once you make a decision and you go down a certain path, that opportunity is doors open for you because you've gone some you've gone done something a little bit differently anyhow i worked for this guy for uh, a couple of years a couple of months and he didn't pay me in, in this because his investors well that's what he told me his investors were backing off and um i think i've done i made a decision then that i considered that was out of flow when I look back on it because it wasn't about my improvement in me. So I want to talk about intrinsic value. So I'll come on to that and then the importance of it, intrinsic value. I was making the decision once again, based on ego and based on money. And I thought basically this guy was, well, he was taking a piss basically. So I was, I was very, I was very aware of it. So I told him exactly what I thought and his response was to tell the authorities that I was working over there without, a, without a, a, a green payment when he was the guy that was meant to source, source it out for me. You know? So that was the end of uh, my career in America. And I've got to say, I, you know, I still look back fondly at those because I met some great people. And there was, although I wasn't time to talk about it tonight, I, I also spent uh, six months working for Mr. Marriott of the Marriott Hotels. And, and, and that was just chauffeuring him up and down uh, um, all uh, 
on the east coast of America looking at racehorses. But there's a, there's a, there is a great story that I, I do hope to share with you on a different occasion. So I want to get back to this decision makers. All of a sudden, let's come back to the UK. I was now not fighting, and um, so that was there was no money coming in, and I had to make a decision. What was I going to do? And I had a friend that was a law lecturer down, down in the college down south, but he also did mixed martial arts that was starting to take off. And he said, John, I want you to come and join us, come and train some of the lads, and, he said, and they'd like you to compete for us, and uh, I'll get you enrolled in college. And that's exactly what happened. I ended up in this college doing a HMD. And I didn't compete again because I thought to myself, I just needed a couple of years. So at that moment in time, I'd made a decision to stop, but I didn't know whether I was going to come back to it or not. So I, I stopped, but I, I, I really enjoyed uh, doing the h and I, I, I had a great time in, in business, really enjoyed it. And then I ended up getting a job for the local authority in London. And it was a very good job. I was what you call a, um, a PO officer uh, for an education department down London. I spent about two and a half years in, in this job. And while I was there, I attended Westminster University and uh, took and I topped up my HMD to a degree. But the money was great, but I felt like, and this is very, very important, I felt like what I was doing was that I was existing but not living. And, and, and I remember that uh, with everything I was doing, it was about feeling a, a, a form of intrinsic value in what I was doing and getting a degree of joy from what I was doing, which was very, very important to me. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> I decided after two and a half years that the environment I was in was quite staid and it just wasn't, it wasn't doing anything for me. And by now, my parents were getting a little bit concerned because I spent up to 25 years being involved in sports, go to college for 25 years. I can remember my dad having been very strong words with me about going back into education at 25. It was 19, uh, was it 1988 when I went back into education then and he, he said it just never happened uh, uh, for his for his generation, and and he he really sort of remonstrated with me about doing it. He since then said to me it's probably the best thing I've done, but at the time he really remonstrated with me. And I, I am really coming to a point on this, so I think it's important to uh, I, I need to tell you exactly what's happened because there's a real valid valued point in what I'm trying to make. So I came back up north, I packed in that job, and I had no form of income. My parents were a bit upset for me, and I then trained to be a teacher in Edgehill College in Ormsgate, and I passed. And I'm now teaching, supply teaching in various schools. But I realised I didn't want to teach, because as much as I enjoyed the contact and the teaching, what I didn't enjoy was the administration, the sort of back office, and it seemed to be taking over the role. So I did supply teaching, but again, my parents were upset because they couldn't quite, you know, you're a sportsman, you went to college very late in life, and then after going to college, you had this fantastic, you packed it up, you've been offered a teaching job, and you're not teaching. It seems like you're doing something, and there's no real purpose to it. But let me tell you now, in everything I've learned, in everything I've done, there was a learning outcome, and there was a purpose for it, and I feel as if there's been great value. So for instance, when I write a pro and online course now, I'm thinking about learning outcomes. I'm thinking about how I write a lesson plan. There is nothing that, um, that I've been taught and which has not been used on that had value. So as I was supply teaching, I then trained to become an accountant with BPP in Liverpool. And I stayed with them till the early 90s and supply teaching. And I passed with the association chartered of certified accountants. And I was offered the job as, a, as, as elderly as I was, I, uh, which was in the early 30s by them, uh, a job which I didn't take. And again, my parents just didn't understand 
that uh, why I was getting trained to do something, but I didn't appear to be doing anything with it. But for me, there felt no real value. There was no intrinsic value in what I was doing. And then back in the mid nineties, when I passed, I, I decided that what I was going to do was help business. And I would help business by placing an advert in the paper because there was no social media then, there was no Facebook, there was no YouTube, there was no Instagram. So it was either a TV advert, a radio advert, or a paper advert. And what I did was um, I placed an advert in saying, look, if you're in business and you think you're paying too much tax, then I think I can help you. If I can't help you, no, no cost. But if I can, let's have a chat. And I got one response. One response. And this guy on the phone sound absolutely awful. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was going to meet. But when I met this guy, he was a serial entrepreneur. He had houses, shopping, shopping malls, industrial states all over the UK. But he also happened to be Jimmy White, the snooker player's manager. And um, I went through, I had a great time. It was almost a great, well, it was not almost, it was a great education. I seen how this guy put deals together. I seen how he dealt with people. And you could put, if you put in a, when um, Jimmy White was caught in Thailand, you will see this, this manager's name. He, he's there next to him. So we're going back to the 90s. Uh, with, with the manager and Jimmy White get, gets caught in Thailand and of course he, he was consequently divorced as a consequence to, to that but anyhow um, I was all of a sudden I was meeting people doors were flying open again and uh, I would then went into a career for near 25 years within property myself and I had a fantastic career a really good career uh, traveled all over the world, took the kids with me all over the world. My, my two children went, attended private school. And uh, I was really enjoying putting those deals together, uh, enjoying helping landlords with their investment portfolios, showing them the best way to put a structure together to mitigate a tax position. I found that really challenging. And it, for me, it was the meeting of people, listening to their, their issues. And I felt the improvement from my point of view was being able to make better their situation. Because if you can add value, that's great. And I, I got a great deal out of satisfaction out of doing that. But after 20 years, George Osborne comes in, he changes all the law on the restriction of mortgage interest relief known as section 24. And then um, <clears throat> there was a lot of other compliance. And I realized that I was lo losing my love and joy in what I was doing. And I had to make another big decision. And I decided that if I wasn't enjoying it again, I had to have this big change in my life. And that's exactly what I did. I sold, I, I lined the business up for sale and I sold it successfully in 2018. And then I had this other big decision I had to make. What was I going to do? I knew I wanted to coach. I knew I wanted to help people, but I wanted to have something that was different and something that was quite unique. And there was a program in the Netherlands, Amsterdam, called Mind5. They contacted me, knew about my sporting background, and they said to me, John, why don't you come over? Have a look what we're doing. And it was all about experimental learning. And it was fantastic. And that was the very first time I learned about a guy called Mihai Chixen Mihai, a hung Hungarian psychologist who wrote a book about the flow state. And it suddenly made complete sense to me because I'd experienced this. I'd experienced flow not just in my sport but in my work and, and that was the that was a real learning outcome for me it really became so vivid for me i knew it was there but no one had ever really uh, written about it 
So what is flow and how does flow help you in your decision making? Well, there's an actress called Joyce Grenfell. And she said, there's no such thing as the pursuit of happiness, but there is the discovery of joy. Now, Joyce Grenfell, you will know her. She appeared in the 1950s UK black and white movies, often with Alistair Sim. And Alistair Sim was the actor who played Scrooge in the famous 1950 A Christmas Carol. So you will know Alistair Sim. And if you think of the old St. Trinian's movies that were made in the UK around that time, you will know Joyce Grenfell. And I just want to repeat what she said. There's no such thing as the pursuit of happiness, but there is the discovery of joy. Happiness is very fleeting, but if you can find intrinsic joy in what you are doing, then <clears throat> that has value to you. And if it has value to you, you're more likely to, to have success in what you're doing. You're more likely to be able to build up your decision-making muscle because you want to take control. You want to improve what you do because you find it to be a joyful experience. And it was as a consequence of that, when I started thinking about flow, then I put this, when I've called my ref model or my flow learning cycle, and it contains six parts. It's about reflection, resolving, refocus, resetting, evolving, and eventually into flow. Now, it's very easy to talk about these things. And remember, knowledge, knowledge itself without action is merely philosophy. But knowledge with action becomes experience. And although we can know this, and I can tell you what you need to do, without the practice of patterns with what you're doing, you will never be able to build that decision-making muscle. It's an important integral part of the reprogramming of your subconscious mind so you learn to respond without having consciously to without consciously having to think so reflect which is the first part of the model ask you to think about what it is you want to do where do you want to go and then to learn to resolve try to change things on the move so you're not consciously stopping but you're changing things on the move and then learn to refocus quickly so you drop the bad and you keep the good thereby you're improving and then you reset you walk it through your head you walk it through you said a number of times until you can begin practicing 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 and at the point of evolving in what you're doing you're happy until you, you keep repeating until you're happy with the rhythm with the pattern as it's beginning to form never forgetting that you're trying to improve what it is you're doing and eventually you'll find yourself in flow you're responding without consciously having to think so i i gave a real big thought with regard to this is how can i help build your decision making muscle that's what this boils down to how can i help people add value to their lives so they can build their own decision making muscle and knowing that the pathway of control for you having the confidence to step out is all about the power of patterns pattern power of patterns in the way that you perform so you get used to making decisions on the move so look i know i'm, I'm running out of time i i, I realize that and i really feel like we've really only begun to sort of discuss the the tip of the sort of iceberg and all the juicy points i'd really like to talk about are, are, are like an iceberg are underneath but are yet to be discovered and have been the, my sort of journey over the last four or five years so I'm betting now that you have some big, big decisions to make in your life because of what we're facing now. You need a strategy to take command and control of your own destiny. Well, I'd like to be that person to help you, to help you make more effective decisions. I spent over 30 years in business. 
has competed in sports at the national and an international level. I'd really like to lock arms with you and make sure you complete your transformation as a successful decision maker. Flow is essentially about learning patterns and making decisions on the move. If you can do that, and of course it is within you, the only thing that ever stops you is commitment. You have to be prepared to make a commitment. So what is a commitment? A commitment is to see something through, not to dabble in it, but to make sure that you do it. Once you've made a decision, you go with it. As Tony Robbins says, if you're going to take the island, you burn all your boats. You've made the decision and you go forward. Sometimes it may not work out exactly the way you would anticipate or expected. More often, it won't. But new doors of opportunity will arrive because you've made this decision to move forward. What you will learn in your decision making is cognitive mastery. Knowing is not enough. Repetition is the mother and father of all of, of, of all your decisions. You'll learn emotional mastery, connection by the rewiring of the brain. The more you learn to make decisions on the move, you're creating synaptic connections within your brain. You're actually growing your brain. And then, of course, you have the physical mastery. You practice so, so many times that you no longer have to consciously think about what you're doing. Power is recognition, power to recognize patterns. By doing so, changing your level of circumstances, take control, patterns provide power. Learn to use your patterns to great effect. Through pattern, you can create and enter your own flow cycle and improve your decision making. So on, on that basis, what I've done is I've created a very unique online learning course that deals with them. It consists of six modules from, from building up your confidence, stepping out and making the decision to, to understanding what flow is. You, you, flow is not something to be talked or discussed about. You've got to live it. You have to experience it. That is flow. It's about learning and learning about coordinated rhythms and non-intuitive forms simultaneously moving all your limbs. And that way you're making all these decisions all at the same time, but you become accomplished through practice. Goes all the way through uh, to six modules. And essentially what you then do is learn through these systems how to get into flow. But most importantly, the last module, which I think is the most essential thing, is about you learn to learn how to get into flow through the way you live your life. So we evolve and develop within the program itself, how you break down what you do. So you also can get into flow and you can build your decision-making muscle. What are the benefits of this course? Well, the benefits of this course are this. First of all, it's not physically challenging because there would be no point in that. But what it is, what it does do, it makes you move in patterns in non-intuitive ways, simultaneously moving your limbs in ways that would probably be a little bit unexpected. But once you've learned to coordinate that, you've made progression. You're learning patterns. Once you've learned the patterns, you're having to make decisions on the move, and that's the outcome. You will be able to build your decision-making muscle because you will feel more confident about learning to control your body, not in the physical way, but in the way that you move your body. So you're learning to improve. And you will learn to change your mindset. Everything that you do in the future will be about making improvements for you. And that's essentially what the end result is about. It's about building that decision-making muscle, which is what my own online course is built to do. Now, I want to provide you with value. And I thought about that consistently all the time. So I want to tell you about what I've done. 
My course is currently at this moment in time being built. I expect it to be built or finished by the end of November. It will be an online course that will take you through those six modules. That course will retail at £1,297. However, on this one night, this one time, I'm going to make this offer with a few bonuses. I'm going to offer this course this evening for 995 because it's not built, it's not finished. And that means you can make three separate payments, one of 395 and then two of 300 over the next few weeks. My book is due to come out in November. That explains all the processes as well. I will give you a free copy, a free signed copy of that book. And what I will also do when you get to module six, and if you were to commence it during December and you really went all in and you went at it, I would not anticipate or expect you to be finished uh, before January. But in January, I would offer you two hours on a one-to-one -one as part of that when I would help you build flow into your course and what you do in a daily basis so you learn to find joy and intrinsic value because this is what it's about. If you're finding value and intrinsic joy in what you're doing, you're more inclined to want to improve. So this is a discovery. It's a journey for you to find out not only how to make your decisions, but to find, to find value in what you're doing so you can have intrinsic joy. So <clears throat> what I'd like to know is, um, what I, in fact, what I'll drop in the chat is my email address. If you would like more, more information, I can go through it. Or if you would like to go for it, please drop me an email to that email now. Please drop me an email. Just before you go, because um, I realize we've, we're just nearly upon the hour right now. I hope I've saved you, and I hope most importantly that I've really given you something to think about and come from something at a completely different angle. I understand that the decisions you make now are a commitment, but that's what it's all about. If you want improvement, you need to make a commitment. Improvement in your decision making, improvement in finding value and intrinsic joy in what you want to do with your life. The journey begins, we're all on the journey, but this is a way to ensure that you get to where you need to be. And I can honestly tell you from the heart that when I followed this process and discovering and becoming so aware of what I've been doing with regards to uh, breaking things down, putting them back together, assembling, coming at them different angles, seeking improvements of what I was doing, felt the joy in the control over my body, realizing I was making decisions on the move without stopping to think, to get you to a point that you can respond fast because you feel confident to do it because of what you've learned. The way you've integrated the knowledge into your body provides for you uh, much confidence. Repetition is a power, and I'm providing you with that power. That's the most important thing. It just remains for me to say, look, thank you very much for your time. Really do appreciate it. Love to see your comments about what you think about the content and what I had to share with you this evening. And <clears throat> just to thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart for you taking your time out and uh, for listening to me this evening. Thank you.